Um, we should also be on Facebook. And I am going to go ahead and start recording. And we'll, uh, we'll start in a couple minutes as folks are um, starting to trickle in. It's wonderful to see everyone. So great to see you all. And for those who are here early, um, uh, I think our names are here. So I am Dr. Mary Camille Danico, and Daniela Castillo is the Weglin intern. And then, you know, I'll be introducing more formally our esteemed guest, Frank Avia, who's here with us. All right. And I'm going to, um, Daniela, if you can also just check on Facebook to make sure it's going live and you're able to see it. It's on my Facebook page, but then I move it over to all the other community sites um, that are normally there. So if you can just check to see if you see it live, that would be great. All right, and I'm just going to go ahead and invite some folks that I know that wanted to be here. Uh, you got a special shout out from Grace, Frank. Uh, Grace has been a, a, a kind of a, a following the tour, as it were. Oh, from nice. New from New Jersey, yeah. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. Very, very nice. And Daniela, if you want to go on the um, invitation and just invite some of our Wegland committee members, that would be great. Sometimes folks have a hard time finding it. But I am going to go ahead and um, welcome everyone. I know it's one minute early, but I want to make sure that we maximize the time that we have with Frank and just welcome all of you to our launch of spring semesters, Wegelin Endowed Chair Social Justice Series. So I am so excited and thrilled to have our guest here today. But before that, I wanted to start off with land acknowledgement. Um, and we at Cal Poly Pomona respectfully acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Tongva peoples and all their ancestors, elders and descendants, past, present and emerging. We also recognize this land known as Los Angeles County today is also home to many indigenous peoples from all over. And we're grateful for the opportunity to live and work here as guests of these lands, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the, of the Tongva. So thank you so much. I know that many of you come from different places and lands. And so if you want to put on the chat box, you know, where you're currently residing and where you're coming from, please feel welcome to use that space as an inter interactive tool. Uh, my name is Dr. Mary Camille Danico, and I have the honor of being the director of the Weglin Endowed Chair for Multicultural Studies. And to my left, I guess, is I don't know if it's right or left on the screen, is Daniela Castillo, my incredible Weglin intern who's been with me for a year now and has been doing much of the invisible heavy lifting that you all don't see, but I so appreciate. So I'd like you to give her a little shout out and, and claps in your own virtual spaces. And I am so thrilled to, invite, um, to introduce Frank Abe, who I've been following for a long period of time. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about his work in a second. I do want to tell a little bit about the Wegel Endowment for those of you who may be new to the space. So Michi Weglin is a survivor of the Japanese internment and wrote this um, incredible book called Years of Infamy. And Walter Weglin uh, is a survivor of the Holocaust. And together they met in New York and um, found you know, solidarity and love you know, through their shared commitment to social justice work. Their friendship and relationships with our former president, Bob Suzuki and Agnes Suzuki led to this endowment. And for them, it was really vital for us to continue the work that they started um, and ensuring that social justice for all is something that we continue, continue to strive for. And so for, for many of us who are witnessing, unfortunately, um, you know, the crimes against Black Americans and the anti-Asian hate, um, the, the fleeing of Afghan refugee and what's happening right now in Ukraine. A, a lot of these things that, and much more, much more, are things that Michi and Walter would feel very passionately about in trying to outreach to our community to ensure that we're all on the same page to fight for justice for everyone, and especially in terms of social justice issues. So with that, I wanted to give an introduction 
to our esteemed guest, um, Frank Abe. And, you know, I think for those of you who may know uh, Frank, and I know that he has many followers here to, with us today, um, you know, really became it for me, you know, really well known because of his work in the anthology of John Okada, um, you know, one of the very first uh, to write about the no-no boys. And so many folks know about the 442nd um, during the internment, but very few people surprisingly are aware. And I think Frank played a vital role along with um, Greg and um, Greg Robinson and um, Floyd. Oh, gosh, I, he's going to kill Chung. me because I know him. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know you, Floyd Chung of Smith College. Floyd, sorry, Floyd, because you know Floyd does incredible work. Um, the anthology on John uh, Makata, I think, has been instrumental, and you know uh, they've received awards, and I, Frank has also been a part of the award-winning PBS documentary Conscience and the Constitution. His most recent work, you know, he's the co-author of a new graphic novel. Um, which I haven't watched, read yet, but I, I'm just so excited to read because it is a novel on the Japanese American resistance to wartime incarceration titled We Hereby Refuse. And so when I saw this and after following his work um, on John Akata, I was just so excited to um, purchase the book. So it, I think it finally came to my office uh, yesterday, maybe. I haven't seen it yet, but I think it finally might have arrived yesterday and also give all of you an opportunity to have a copy of the book. And so I think one of the things that we're so fortunate is to have Frank who can give us a wealth of information and experience um, about, he's gonna tell you a little bit about his relation with Michi, but also his insight and his, his narrative um, and his biography that led him to author all these incredible books. So please welcome, help me welcome Frank to our virtual space and launching off the social justice series. Welcome, Frank. Thank you so much, Mary. It's, it's really an honor to be here. And before I begin, I do want to make two personal observations. First, it is an honor for me to speak at the school that carries the name of Michi and Walter Weglin. Uh, I was fortunate to have been mentored in this field of study by Michi some 30 years ago at a time when we were all trying to understand and expand the study of the camps. And Michi was just the sweetest and most caring of friends. Uh, Michi was the first supporter of our film on the Heart Mountain Resistors. Uh, Walter was such a cheerful and loving partner. He, he supported whatever she did, right? So Michi kept us going when our spirits were low. Early on, I ran into some conflicts in the Japanese American community because of the nature of our story, uh, not a popular story. And she sent me a two sentence letter that I had tacked on my wall for many years. It read, you are our hope for the future. Never, never allow yourself to be cowed by cowards. Uh, Michi at first didn't want to appear in our film and it took years of coaxing her before she finally sat down and talked to us. And she emerges on screen as someone who's so elegant and incisive, a scholar of passion and commitment and conviction who brought her heart to our film. And this was just before her decline in health began to show. And, you know, I've always thought maybe she knew, maybe it was her gift to us. I don't know, uh, but she did leave us a, a small bequest to help in finishing the film. I say this because it's really in her spirit and her memory that, that I continue. And one of the things I'll touch upon later is how I was able to pay it for, pay, pay her back by paying it forward uh, in the writing of this graphic novel. Second, speaking here is meaningful because Pomona is where my father was detained in World War II in 1942. You may not be aware, but your campus is located four miles from the site of a World War II concentration camp. So just let me uh, share my screen and bring this up and click this button here and you will see this is my father was an immigrant from japan uh, his family basically had no room for him and sent him here to make his own way as a field worker in san jose california he was 16 when, when japan attacked the u.s at pearl harbor start world war ii 17 years old when president roosevelt signed the executive order 80 years ago this week this is the day of remembrance uh, 
the order that authorized the removal of my father and 120,000 other persons of Japanese ancestry from their homes on the West Coast and imprisoned them first in 16 assembly centers, temporary detention centers, uh, while it was building 10 more permanent concentration camps. And Pomona was one of those temporary camps, the Pomona Assembly Center, hastily erected at what's now called, I believe, the Fairplex, the site of the Los Angeles County Fair on West McKinley Avenue. Uh, later in life, this is what my father wrote about that. Uh, on one weekend day in May, like many other weekend, we drove to J-Town, Nihonmachi. As we came to Second Street, we began to see some kind of notices on telephone poles. Not until we drove by front of Teachers College, now San Jose State, on 4th Street, we noticed the word Japanese on notice. It was big notice, so almost we could read the whole thing from car, but we stopped and closed up. We stopped and closed up. It was evacuation notice to all Japanese and Japanese ancestry living in restricted area in West Coast. It captured us by surprise. Uh, I couldn't read all, but I understood what it meant. And then we look around and my God, the notices were all over the city. They sure made that no one Japanese missed it. I'm reading his literal words here. We made U-turn and came, ah, okay, uh, recording in progress. Uh, we made U-turn and came back to labor camp. We began to pack things in whatever we can carry and waited. I felt sorry for people with house and business. They told me that it is better to go as one family unit. So me as head of family teamed up with two other single men about 60 years old. The night before evacuation all took nice fudo bath and ate good meal. To this day, I don't know how we went to the station. Every Japanese and Niseis in Santa Clara County were assembled here at train station, about 5,000 people. Little by little, train left when we filled up. Me and my family, air quotes, stayed together on board. The train traveled by night. I woke. Look outside, it was town of Burbank. The train still going now slowly. We were in the city of Los Angeles. Not much later, it came to stop. It was town of Pomona, or better yet is Pomona County Fairground. We got off and marched straight to the building and registration desk. What is your family number? I said, us three are together and our family number is 32265. We were already given the number at the train station before we board it. Us three were assigned to the bachelor quarter with other bunch of bachelors. It was barrack number 425. Actually, it was nothing but horse stalls. The horse races were canceled for the duration. After we unload the baggage, we went to the haystack to fill up the bag which give to us make mattress. That done, we went to mess hall for our first meal. Later, he wrote of uneventful days passing of how he could hear the murmur of the cottonwood trees against the wind. In August, nearly everyone at Pomona was put in a train for the more permanent camp in Wyoming called Heart Mountain. Uh, that's him staying. Uh, this is him standing on the left, far left for the mess hall crew at Heart Mountain. So what did my father do to deserve this? Nothing. Uh, his only crime was his race. Uh, anyone with at least 1 16th Japanese blood was rounded up and taken away. No hearing, no due process, no equal protection under the law. Well, the same was true for the, the three characters in We Hereby Refuse. They did nothing to deserve this, right? Everything they took, well, they took things a step further and pushed back against the government that they felt betrayed them. Uh, Jim Okutsu of Seattle refused to be drafted for an American concentration camp in Idaho. Uh, Mitsuya Endo lent her name to a habeas corpus petition against illegal detention uh, that went to the Supreme Court. And Hiroshi Kashiwagi refuses to sign a loyalty questionnaire after the government had taken everything from him and Japanese America. So before the war, each of these characters was no different from any other idealistic American kid who was ready and willing to serve their country if called upon. Uh, let's take each of their stories in turn. Uh, Jim Okutsu of Seattle tried to enlist in the army two or three times, but was rejected because of flat feet. Jim is shocked uh, to come home and find his father being arrested by the FBI. Now, his father is just a cobbler, a shoe repairman, not a business leader or a Buddhist priest like those arrested before. Uh, his father and 100 others are held at the immigration detention station in Seattle, which 
incidentally, was also where my, where my father was detained when he first arrived on a ship from Japan. From there, Mr. Akutsu and the others are put on a train for the DOJ, the Justice Department internment camp, the alien internment camp uh, at Fort Missoula, Montana. And on the right, uh, you can see the um, outstretched arms of their wives screaming out their goodbyes in good Japanese and English. Uh, the men wonder if they would ever see their families again. For Japanese America, this was a family separation, not unlike those we saw a few years ago at the southern border. Jim is bused to the Puyallup Fairgrounds, south of Seattle. This is an assembly center comparable to the Pomona Assembly Center, uh, while they're waiting for construction of the more permanent camp at Minidoka, Idaho. Uh, then the War Department, um, two years later, reinstitutes the draft for the, for the Nisean camp. For Jim and his brother Gene, this was the last straw because so far they've complied with the expulsion, they've complied with the incarceration, they've not lifted a finger against the US government, and yet they've been treated as if they were the enemy. So the draft, the Selective Service, was the last chance to lodge a protest. They refuse to report for induction, they break the law, the Selective Service Act, uh, until their rights are first restored and their parents relief, released from camp and freed to go home. They insist on being treated as loyal Americans before performing the duties of a loyal American. They're taken to a jail in Boise, Idaho, where they're tried for draft evasion in federal court. The judge refuses to allow the jury to consider any of the moral or legal arguments uh, uh, that the Akutsu brothers raise. Uh, the jury takes only a few minutes to go out and smoke a cigarette before returning in a few minutes to uh, render the verdicts of guilty. It, it really is kind of a kangaroo court. The young men are sentenced to three years, three months at McNeil Island, south of Seattle, federal penitentiary. They aren't released until 1946 after the war, well after everyone has been released from camp or returned from combat. And for the rest of their lives, as Mary kind of alluded to, they are shunned by the community for challenging the government on this question of loyalty. Okay, let's take the story of Mitsuya Endo of Sacramento. She was a key a key punch operator for the Department of Employment in California. After Pearl Harbor, the California Personnel Board suspends all employees of Japanese ancestry on suspicion of their loyalty. Uh, but Endo was one of 63 employees, state employees, who organized and hired attorney James Purcell to contest their termination. Uh, in the middle of their case, however, the Army evicts all Japanese Americans from Sacramento and Endo's bus to the Sacramento Assembly Center where James Purcell identifies her as the perfect plaintiff for a habeas corpus case to challenge the government's ability to indefinitely imprison admittedly loyal US citizens. Endo you know, is reluctant at first, but she shakes hands to signal her agreement to be the named plaintiff. Lawyers for the WRA fear the strength of her case because they know the legal ramifications of a habeas corpus case. Uh, and sent its chief solicitor to Topaz, where she was, to offer her the chance to leave camp uh, if she drop her case, which would essentially make her case moot. Because if she's no longer held in camp, if her, if her body, her, her corpus is not locked up, the case gets dismissed. So here, Endo can do what's best for herself or best for the good of all, act for the good of all. And what she says is, in a letter to her attorney, I'm willing to go as far as I can on this case. For her, it means staying in camp for another two full years until her case does reach the Supreme Court, where the court rules the Roosevelt administration has no legal right for the long-term imprisonment of admittedly loyal US citizens. And she celebrates her victory when she receives a telegram. The third story in the graphic novel is that of Hiroshi Kashiwagi, and let me spend a little more time with him because his story is a very complex one and one that cuts to the very question of Nono Boy's loyalty. And it's a story that's so misrepresented and misunderstood even by members of the Japanese American community, especially by members of the Japanese American community. Uh, Hiroshi was just two years out of high school, uh, helping his family sharecrop uh, on a fruit ranch outside Sacramento waiting to go to college. 
uh, he was removed first to the Marysville Assembly Center. So this assembly center is like Pomona up and down the West Coast. Uh, all you know, racetracks or migrant labor camps built near, near um, population centers. Uh, so on the train, then brought by train to Tule Lake on the California-Oregon border. Uh, at first, Tule Lake is just one of these, of one of 10 war relocation centers, no different from the others. But Hiroshi wasn't there long, um, just about six months uh, before the needs of two different agencies came together in what I now realize was a catastrophic bureaucratic bungle over the question of loyalty. And this question divides Japanese America forever. Uh, first, uh, as Mary mentioned, many young Nisei men wanted a way to prove they were just as American as everyone else by volunteering for the army in the fight against fascism. Uh, the community leaders of the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, uh, lead the call for the army to admit the Nisei into the armed services. Problem is, the army has already effectively branded the Japanese Americans as untrustworthy or suspicious by the fact of having locked them up in Pomona Assembly Center in Hartmont and Tudor Lake. And, and so now they need kind of a reverse PR campaign to clear the volunteers individually as eligible for, for service because, you know, the, you know, the nation does not want to admit, you know, spies and saboteurs into the U.S. Army. Um, by the same token, the mission of the War Relocation Authority was to eventually relocate families into homes away from the exclusion zone on the West Coast and into jobs and homes in the East and Midwest. Uh, but it is it, it too needed a way some way to clear them for resettlement, because if you're living in Oberlin, Ohio, for example, uh, you don't want the the government, you know, the government to move in these potential spies and saboteurs that were locked up on the West Coast, and there must have been some reason for that. So uh, I want to be sure that you've cleared them, right? You've cleansed them, you, you've certified them. So the, the the Army and WRA come up with what for them was the perfect paper trail, a loyalty oath a questionnaire. And I, I have to say, after having worked myself in King, local King County government for 25 years, I understand how bureaucracies work and a, a questionnaire or a paper is, is a perfect way to cover your ass uh, in case something goes wrong later. And this is exactly what they do. Uh, questions, this is ultimately called the leave clearance questionnaire um, or, or statement of US citizens, citizen. And the last two questions, as you can see in this was the, were the tricky ones. 27, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the U.S. from any and all attacks by foreign or domestic forces? You know, cool so far. And forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor. So the Army, WRA, think these are simple. No one could have any problem with these. Uh, but when this questionnaire lands in camp, uh, everyone is up in arms about it. Uh, many in camp said, if you'd asked me these questions before you took away my home, my business, my farm, and locked me up here, for sure, I probably would have said yes, uh, no problem. But by this time, you know, it's one year into the war, January 43, uh, and one year into their imprisonment, Hiroshi and many others were fed up with the government and JCL continually demanding that they prove their loyalty. And Hiroshi refuses to sign the loyalty oath, especially when no one, not even the camp administration, knows the consequences of a yes or no answer. As Hiroshi wrote in one of his plays, I'm sick and tired of saying yes to everything. Yes, I'll go to camp. Yes, I'll serve in the army. Yes, I'll declare my loyalty. I'll prove my loyalty by standing for my rights as an American. And he holds fast and refuses to sign the questionnaire, as I say. It was only under the threat of five years in prison and a $10,000 fine, a penalty that, in fact, was later discovered to be invented by officials and, in fact, not true or enforceable. It was after that threat that Hiroshi was compelled to write down no and no on the questionnaire. So all this loyalty questionnaire does is create an administrative class of people who on paper have to be characterized by the clerks in the government as not loyal 
when they refused to answer or answered no. Now, remember, these people have committed no acts of disloyalty. They've not spied, sent, sent you know, military plans to the emperor. They've not planted bombs anywhere. All they've done is put down answers under threat of prison time and stiff fines on a poorly understood questionnaire, which, for again, no one has any consequences, idea of the consequences. And the consequence that was unknown at the time was that the WRA would take these forms, these pieces of paper, and use them to sort 100,000, 120,000 questionnaires into two piles, yes and no. Very, you know, government's very binary, easy for clerks to understand. Congress then pressures the WRA uh, to segregate the no's from the yeses. And the JUCL, God bless them, demands protection for their own loyalists in camp who are getting beaten up for, being, for their collaboration and cooperation with the government. So the agency obliges by fortifying Tule Lake as its segregation center, and they move in 12,000 from all camps whose names are in the no pile. Let me just say that 12,000 is one-tenth of those who were evicted, right? It's one-tenth of 120,000. That means one in every 10 who uh, Japanese Americans answers no or refuses to answer this doggone questionnaire. So it's, it's, it's more widespread than has really previously been thought, or popularly thought, I should say. Uh, the agency, the WRA, also uh, adds more watchtowers, as you see here, a double man-proof fence, and builds a military stockade to hold inmate leaders. So this becomes a prison inside of a prison. And, and Mary, this is the part of our story where I was guided by the painstaking research of our friend Michi Wagwan. Uh, I'm a self-trained historian, a self-trained historian. So was Michi. You know, Michi was an acclaimed theatrical costume designer, New York City, who designed for eight years on the Perry Como TV show. He's a costume designer, right? And yet Michi was driven to spend years in the National Archives uncovering documents that had been unseen by others. Uh, few others, except perhaps Professor Roger Daniels. Um, and yet seemingly out of nowhere comes this book in 1976 that reveals incriminating documents that show the government knew or had been told of the loyalty of Japanese Americans before the war and still imprisoned them. Right? She devotes entire chapters to the loyalty questionnaire, uh, to Tule Lake, and even a full chapter on the Tule Lake stockade. Um, and, you know, I'd, I, I was, you know, I was there when, when this book first came out, and I always felt that, um, you can see all my, my little my notations and bookmarks here on, on the chapters, uh, I always felt that there was like a movie in, in Michi's uh, storytelling, the ways that she uh, recounts the story of To the Lake and the Stockade and so on. And, um, and, she, and, and she chronicles the story, for example, of George Kuratomi at To the Lake. In the book, she gives him the pseudonym Kunitani, in, in case you want to reread re her book. Uh, George is the leader, as she says, of the Citizen Negotiating Committee uh, and Chile Lake that tries to negotiate with the camp administration. Uh, and for, as a result, was thrown into the stockade without charge or trial and held for nine months. Um, so I was glad to have the opportunity to kind of storyboard out through the graphic novel the, the, the kind of movie that Michi was painting for us in Years of Infamy and do, the, do it through the graphic novel. Uh, Michi also had a, uh, oh, by the, so we, we, should, we draw, this is how we draw George uh, Kuratomi, give him his proper name and, and tell his story, his background story uh, in the graphic novel. Um, Michi had a gift for hyperbole, Mary, and, and that comes out in her text. Uh, and this was a sticker that she had made, made up herself, you know, this is homemade, to promote her book. And I, I love the, do, the double exclamation points and kind of, this is, I mean, this is how Michi viewed her book, Dynamite, a bombshell, um, which I think were also quotes from, from other book reviews. But, but that's, I mean, she, that's how she felt about her, her work. And, and she supported young people like me uh, who showed an interest. And I'm humbled uh, to see this inscription again 
because you know you want to do right by the people who believe in you and 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 michi just had that heart and and she poured it out in in, in with this inscription to me and i, I just you know what can i say affectionately michi and she was she was so sweet um so it's with the template of michi's research that i was able to work out the rest of the story of truly lake um, so getting back to my book what makes it the story of camp as you've never seen it before is that we examine the misapplied label of loyalty and turn it on its head. As several Tulians said at the time, it's not a question of our loyalty, it's the country that's not loyal to us, its own principles, it's not the government that's not loyal to the Constitution. And it is, as I say, government bureauc expediency and bureaucracy that creates a class of disloyals, not the incarceraries. Uh, and creates this class through a purely bureaucratic act. It's only disloyalty on paper, not by action. And under the law, you can't be prosecuted for your thoughts, only for your action. Um, so, you know, this, this kind of shows us that suspicion of disloyalty, false accusations of disloyalty have historically been made solely on the basis of race. It is part of a great American tradition, uh, which, you know, I'll, and leads us later to today. But during this time, members of Congress have been trying to strip the Nisei of their U.S. citizenship. And, and Congress is told that the 14th Amendment guarantees birthright citizenship to anyone born on U.S. soil. So in July of 1944, Congress finds a way around the Constitution. It passes the Denaturalization Act, uh, which for the first time enables a U.S. citizen to voluntarily surrender their citizenship during time of war. The beauty of this, if you will, <clears throat> is you know, why pass a law that will be overturned as unconstitutional when you can get the angry, frustrated, and confused Nisi and camp to voluntarily renounce their citizenship? And many families walk into this trap, including that of Hiroshi Kashiwagi. Hiroshi immediately regrets his decision, desperately tries to withdraw it, but can't. And our story shows how this change from relocation camp to segregation center is what creates the conditions for unrest at Tule Lake. Tule Lake was converted to a high security prison. And where you have a prison, you, you inevitably create prison gangs with pressures for repatriation to Japan, expatriation, denationalization, renunciation, and ultimately, for some, deportation, as Congress wanted. Uh, the 18,000 people who are pushed into the segregation center can see how this government has abandoned them, turned against them, so that all they have to find strength and pride, of themsel and pride in themselves is literally their own bodies, their own skin, their racial ancestry, because that's all they have left. Uh, anger, frustration, and isolation boil over into organization. These are the so-called pro-Japan fanatics at Tule Lake. But again, we show how these groups were a product of the duress of mass incarceration. After all, just stop and think, was there a back to Japan movement after Pearl Harbor, but before the, the mass uh, eviction from their homes? Of course not, no. So it was in this environment that uh, seven of every, and this by the way is a quote from one of those young boys at Tule Lake, young men, uh, who said for the first time, I feel good about being Japanese. Um, and that, that's, you know, that, that's, very, that's a very kind of uh, tricky thing to, to say out loud in the Japanese American community. Um, but it was in this environment that seven of every 10 Nisei, 70% uh, at Chile Lake voluntarily surrender the US citizenship, 70%, including Hiroshi Kashiwaki. He caves in to family pressure to renounce his US citizenship on the belief that it's the one thing that will help keep their family together with all these changes happening and with the possible end of the war. Uh, as one character puts it in the graphic novel, how convenient for the government to give us the chance to self-deport. And we walked right into their trap. Into this turmoil uh, walks San Francisco attorney Wayne Collins. Hiroshi and others recruit him to take on their renunciation cases he wins a stay of deportation for Hiroshi, for one. Then he advises the group that you can no more resign citizenship in time of war than you can resign from human race, as he says. Uh, he points out um, 
that they renounce under the duress of two years of false imprisonment and physical coercion from gangs and camp that the government knowingly allowed to run wild with only rumor and misinformation to guide them. And on the spot, uh, Collins scrawls a sample letter to the Attorney General for Hiroshi and others to copy and, and pass around to start the process of withdrawing their renunciations. Well, the war finally ends. Tuvi Lakes closed in 1946, right, after six months after, after VJ Day. And Hiroshi returns to Sacramento on a bright sunny day, uh, only to find old friends from Tuli Lake ignoring and ostracizing him with the term no no boy used as a slur. And Tuli Lake is a slur too. So, you know, and what disturbs me most is, is how people in my community embrace these labels of troublemaker, disloyal, uh, pro Japan, and no no boy without seeing how these divisions were created not just by the war, but by the actions of the government again, to sort and label its incarcerees into two piles. And as a community, we, we bought right into that. And for 10 years after the war, uh, Wayne Collins single-handedly fights the Justice Department to restore citizenship to uh, Hiroshi and 5,000 others who had renounced it to the late. Hiroshi was always grateful to Wayne Collins. Uh, he dedicated his memoirs to Collins and Michi Weglin dedicates years of infamy to him as well. In fact, it was only when Michi published her book in 1976 that Hiroshi made what was for him a startling discovery, that the threats that were made to bully him into answering no on the loyalty questionnaire instead of refusing to answer it or leaving it blank. These threats were just made up by the camp director at the time. There was no force of law. It couldn't be enforced. So. Again, as a whole, this is a much darker story. The Tuli Lake story is a much darker story <clears throat> than is popularly told. Uh, and it's, as you can see, a very complex one. So you can see why um, former Tulians and Japanese Americans in general clam up when asked about it. It's really just a case of blaming the victim and not the culprit, which was the US government. Uh, so race was an issue in World War II and race continues to divide, to divide us today. Let me wrap up uh, by showing how we made the leap from past to present uh, by reading from the final pages. The book ends with Hiroshi uh, working after the war at the San Francisco Public Library, uh, describing how attorney Wayne Collins won back the citizenship that he had renounced. Um, after 35 years, can you imagine my chagrin, my dismay, when I learned there was no law that required draft agent you say to answer that loyalty questionnaire in camp, all those threats of prison and fines, all lies. I was angry all over again. At least I'm able to unburden myself with others who are cast out from our own community, even to this day. To be an American is a privilege that I appreciate. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that America must unburden itself too. Those are his real words. The government was wrong to single us out for exclusion based solely on our race. It was wrong then, and it would be wrong now. And whenever we see America turn against a people because of their race or their religion or their whatever, we won't just stand by. We won't just go along. I will speak up. I will see that every person gets a fair hearing. I will be the friend we didn't have when we needed one the most. It happened to us. We refuse to let it happen again. So I've been pleased to see how Japanese Americans have, um, in the present day, become allies to others, whether it was after 9-11 or during the Muslim travel ban, or more recently with family separations at the, at the southern border. Um, you know, we know that race was the only characteristic common to the 120,000 people locked up in World War II. And we can see how race is still dividing us today. Um, so thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm glad I finally had the opportunity to share the story with you as the very distinguished holder of the Michi and Walter Weglin Endowed Chair of Multicultural Studies. And I'll, I'll, hand it, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Frank. I, I mean, 
I appreciate so much the connection that you made to Michi and um, it, it was truly touching. And, you know, I, I had goosebumps at different parts of your, of your talk and just the connection. And I never had the fortune of meeting Michi from, from, from every single person who's ever shared their stories. It's always the same, smart, brilliant, um, a great historian, gentle, kind, compassionate, and eloquent. And so thank you so much for infusing a lot of her work and her life's work into what you're doing and continuing that legacy. You know, it's, it's really interesting because it is, it is 80 years now since the executive order 9066. And last week on February 19th was the day of remembrance. And, and I think really every day, and I love the way you wrapped up um, this talk is by connecting it to never again to anybody else, right? Because if it happened to us, it could happen to others. So thank you for bringing that to light because the work of the past continues, right? Um, lessons that we, we should learn from the lessons of the past and ensure that we contribute to you know, our community at large. One thing that I wanted to kind of touch on is you know, your story with your dad being in the Pomona Fairplex. And this is an area that many folks don't realize that in California, right in our backyards, except for a couple of our dis dis uh, distinguished guests on the side who actually study this, such as uh, Dr. Jocelyn Packlub, who's um, watching with us. Um, many folks don't realize this. And the other part that folks don't realize is that when Michi received her honorary doctorate from Cal Poly Pomona, many of the surviving no-no boys were present, um, cheering her on as she received her honorary doctorate because she did have a very close connection um, with those who resisted, right, and really fought for social justice. So I was, I was curious to see, how do you stay motivated to continue to tell the story and let current generations, younger generations, because a lot of folks don't know that this happened. You know, if you, if you pull college students or high school kids, many, it, it's still not taught, right? And with the passage of the ethnic studies requirement, I'm hoping that it'll get better. I do too. How do you oh. continue to do this? How do you continue to do the work? And what is some words of wisdom that you would share with educators and community practitioners to engage the youth as well as older generations? You know, this is a very good question, Mary. Uh, I, you, you would think that maybe I'll, I'm driven by some anger. Well, I'm driven by anger and frustration. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose that it was the growing up in the 60s and 70s in an era when this subject was uh, dominated, the narrative was dominated by the deniers and the, um, uh, the S.I. Hayakawas of the world and the Lillian Bakers of the world uh, who uh, insisted that the camps were for our own protection, that um, they we were fed well, the camps provided good opportunities for us to assimilate, and in all the, in, in general, they benefited Japanese America by integrating us into American society after the war. And this is this is Hayakawa's line, and and Lillian Baker, the one person Americans for historical accuracy in Southern California, uh, you know, took the same. She was not a camp denier, but she was a camp um, minimalist. I mean, she 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 minimized uh, the 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 unconstitutionality she she or she, she she denied the unconstitutionality of the camps uh <clears throat> and said we were you know we were fed well and treated well we, we weren't put to death like in, in nazi germany and we should be grateful for that uh so is in that in that frustration of growing up with uh, a community that was dominated in our own so I mean, that was the outside world of hot talk radio when when you when you spoke about the internment camps uh incarceration that you were shouted down by the Lillian Bakers of the world, uh, whether it's in letters to the editor or on talk radio, which was then new in the 70s. In our own community, Mary, the, um, the, the dominating narrative was that of the model minority, uh, uh, the book Nisei, The Quiet Americans by Bill Hosokawa. I opened that up in, in during a break from college uh, when I was a sophomore, uh, so that the same age as many of our, of our viewers here. And I was shocked to discover, I mean, and, and that was my introduction to the actual subject of camps. I didn't learn it in high school, Cupertino High School. And I was shocked to discover pictures of, you know, incarcerees, like I showed you the trains and the camps. And I was a shocked 
and B, when I, when I read the book, kind of nauseated by the narrative that Japanese Americans' response to this massive injustice of violation of civil rights in the American 20th century could be characterized in one or two kind of Japanese terms. One was shikata ganai, Japanese for it can't be helped, passive resignation in the face of injustice. And the second, the other was go for broke, you know, Hawaiian pigeon for uh, go all out, give 110%, it's a gambler's term. And these, neither of these two poles uh, made sense to me because, you know, when, when we would grow up and say, you know, mom, dad, why didn't you resist these, you know, and, and I tell you, Mary, they, they, they'd pat us on the head, uh, figuratively, it's never really happened to me, but they'd pat us on the head and say, uh, well, you're too young. The, this, this part they did say, I mean, you're, you're too young, you know, you weren't born yet, times are different then. Um, you know, you can't go applying your Berkeley civil rights activism of the 60s to 1942. Times are different then. You can't judge us, and don't no, don't don't judge us. Um, but when I met guys like Mitz Koshiyama, the, the people that Michi championed, uh, Mitz Koshiyama, Frank Emmy, uh, Yosh Kurtamiya, the Heart Mountain Resistors, I could see that these guys were not figments of my imagination as a Sansei third generation Japanese American, uh, but really did protest the camps in the only way they could at the time, which was by breaking the law, civil disobedience, getting a test case into federal court, losing, you know, going to federal prison. Um, and, and I wanted to, uh, you know, you, you use my skills as a broadcast journalist at the time to redeem them, to, to tell their story and, and, and honor them in that way. Um, this, by the way, Mary, followed my um, engagement with the Day of Remembrance and helping create the Day of Remembrance originally. And uh, this, this followed the uh, campaign for, to, to secure redress and reparations for the camps. So um, I, I could spend 20 minutes talking about creating the first Day of Remembrance in Seattle in uh, 1978, 44 years ago. Now it's an inventor tradition in Japanese America, wherever Japanese Americans live. And you know, we observe it today, which is, you know, kind of how you brought me here to speak to, to uh, Cal Poly Pomona today. Uh, so it's like full circle. Um, but it was the, um, the need to continually, to answer your question, um, all, there, there are so many opportunities in 1978 for redress, in 1999 to, for the Harbot and Draft Resisters, and just now for the Tule Lake Redunciants and Nonos, to reframe the narrative of Japanese American history, to shift the paradigm and, uh, and to uh, um, uh, recenter these stories in, 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 in Japanese American polite society. Uh, 20 years ago, you couldn't discuss the draft resistors in polite conversation without, you know, making some, you know, people's skin kind of crawl and get nervous uh, because it was just, uh, you know, kind of un uh, to, uh, you being a radical and activist. And this is just 20 years ago, Mary. Um, so I suppose that, you know, the, the, the ability or the need to keep reframing, reshaping, uh, shifting the paradigm um, is what kind of keeps me going. Um, the next thing is going to be uh, with Floyd Chung, a um, anthology of the literature, uh, you know, uh, fiction, poetry, uh, nonfiction, uh, the, the, the literature of Japanese American incarceration for you know, Penguin classics of all people. I can't believe this really, but but Floyd, you know, got me into this in this thing with with Penguin, and so all the books you see on oh, this shoulder uh, is my uh, two bookshelves of book just books that I collected uh, out of interest, just you know pure interest. You know, I out know when Toshio Mori, Hisai Yamamoto, Wakako Yamauchi come to Seattle. I go meet them, go to conferences, meet them, have them sign my books. And um, now I amassed this, you know, database of material uh, that I'm, Floyd and I are kind of like excerpting to build a narrative of, of Japanese American incarceration from the point of view of the incarcerees. You know, it, so it's going to be a little bit different, a different take on an anthology, not just the greatest hits of, you know, the greatest hits <laughs> of, of, of Japanese American literature, but things you haven't seen before. 
uh, voices you haven't heard before, the Joe Kurohara's. Oh, George Kurotomi. We'll, we'll put George Kurotomi's statement mm -hmm. uh, about the stockade in the in this anthology, uh, so that it would be. And I had this, this insight this morning, Mary, that it's going to be a lot like um, Michi's anger in writing this book. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of taking Michi's voice, and you know, it would be as if Michi would editing this anthology. The selections, Floyd and I agreed, it would not be the greatest hits. It would be selections from Japanese American incarceration literature that address the injustice of incarceration, that address the government as the antagonist, as the villain, if you will, of, of the story. Because it is, and 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 that that that's also kind of what makes the graphic novel work so well. If you find it works, mm -hmm. is that the graphic novel? Every every scene, every line is designed to show that the characters pushing back against the twin antagonists of the U.S. government and their partners in the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, so um, that 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 is that pushing. That, that, that informs, you know, Nishi's book, it's gonna inform the anthology. Hey so. Frank, someone did, um, you know, mention Dr. Vallejo, Jesse Vallejo, one is, uh, who's part of the Wegman Advisory Committee. First of all, said such an amazing presentation. Thank you. And wants to know, are, do you have any further graphic novels planned to help share more of the history? You know, that's, I, I could, but I'm not going to, uh, because, I have this anthology to crank out still. And um, then after that, there's going to be a commission to uh, adapt a, a novel for the stage. Mm -hmm. You don't, I didn't mention this, but another of my previous lives was as an actor oh, okay. and theater director uh, with American, uh, I was a student at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco for two years helped found with Frank Chin. Frank Chin founded the Asian American Theater Workshop in San Francisco with ACT. And wow. I was part of that first group. So um, it's going to, I'm going to be returning to my roots that way. Um, and, and and my my pattern, Mary, is be kind of a dilettante, I suppose, but I mean, to do different plot, you know, documentary film, academic book, graphic novel, literary anthology, play. I mean, so yeah, it's the same story, right? It's the same, the same, you know, kind of niche. But uh, so I'm going to keep shifting um, platforms and media to, to tell the story. 